Hey guys, welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. In today's gun store vlog, we are going to be discussing whether or not there is likely to be a growing demand on firearms due to potential legislation that may be coming down the pipeline as a result of the tragic events that happened in Uvalde, Texas over this past week. So if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around. That's coming up now. All right, guys, jumping into this topic, many of you know I try and stay as apolitical as possible on this channel. Now, I have many different people from many different walks of life, even different political affiliations or even different countries who come here and just want to learn about firearm information or information about the firearms industry. Uh, so with that, I will try and maintain true to the objective of this channel and keep my personal beliefs and opinions out of this video and just talk objectively about the question at hand. Now, with that being said, there are going to be a lot of undertones from what did just happen in Uvalde, Texas over this past week, as well as other similar events that have happened in the past with similar circumstances. As discussion of those events is going to be pertinent to the question at hand in this video. Now, with that being said, I did want to get on my soapbox a little bit here and make a couple points. If you want to overpass those and get straight into the meat of this topic, I will have a timestamp to the beginning of the topic of this video pinned to the top down below in the comment section. Getting into this first, I want to, of course, send my just absolute and utmost condolences to the families and community members of Uvalde, Texas, who are currently reeling from what happened on Tuesday when a gunman entered an elementary school and killed 19 children and two staff members. Um, it is unconscionable to even begin to try and imagine what it's like being the parents of those children or extended family of those children or even children who were in the building at the time who will be dealing with scars left behind from what happened for their lifetimes as well as I'm sure future generations to come. Um, I think that all of us share in that emotion and that and that um, you know we we all agree that this is terrible and of course we would like to find a way for this to stop happening in our communities. Leading into that, the second point I want to make is that when you hear such horrific news of children being killed in their school, um, you're going to feel very strong, very visceral human emotion. Now, I know many of you know this, some of you probably need to hear it, but those very visceral human emotions are not reserved for people of one political party, to people of a certain political ideology, or to a group of people who have a certain set of ideas as prescriptions to what has happened to prevent it from happening again. We live in a very diverse community with a very strong diversity of opinion, and I think everybody watching agrees that what we would like to stop seeing is children killed violently in their schools or churches or homes or any other place where they are supposed to be safe. We all agree on that. Now, there is a movement from point A to where we are to point Z, where this hopefully doesn't happen again. And there are many different avenues that we can take as a community to get there, and a lot of us have different beliefs on what those avenues are. But there is not one simple set of ideas or, again, uh, prescriptions to this problem that is the morally virtuous one, and all others held by all other people must be immoral or leading those people to be somehow complicit or responsible for what happened and, and what does happen in places like Sandy Hook or Uvalde, Texas, and in, in, uh, the Robb Elementary School. The responsibility for what happened lays on the shoulders of one person and one person alone. That person is deceased, um, so now we can begin moving through to finding rational, hopefully rational solutions in a very civil manner uh, and, and hopefully move to a point where this does not happen again, at least with the frequency that it does today. So with those points out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into the video. Okay, so jumping into the topic of this video, to reiterate the question, are we on the heels of another gun purchasing panic? I believe the short answer to that question is no, and I think there's three main variables that play into that answer, which I'll explain in this video. Now, it's very interesting to consider that now, after what has just happened in Uvalde, Texas, that would not lead into a gun purchasing panic, when after Sandy Hook, which happened 10 years ago in almost identical circumstances, uh, that did lead into a massive gun panic. Now, Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting happened in December of 2012, just after the second presidential election term of then-President Obama. Now, if we look at the NICS background check data, the months leading up to that, there is a general average of about 1.5 million background checks per month 
Following the Sandy Hook shooting, the background checks ticked up to an average of about 2.5 million per month, nearly doubling, which lasted until about the summer of 2013 when it started to die back down. So it was a very short-lived panic compared to things like what we saw during the pandemic of 2020 to just exiting that sort of the slowdown happening in about 2022. Now, if we look at the circumstances between Sandy Hook and the Robb Elementary School shootings, they were very similar. The casualty list is about the same. The demographic of the victims is about the same. The demographic of the shooter in terms of age and gender are about the same. The profile of the weapon used is similar enough. Um, but yet we had a very strong surge in gun purchases after that, but not today. In fact, if you even look at the political fallout, following Sandy Hook, it is very much in step with the political fallout that's happening today. The talking points actually of then President Obama and now President Joe Biden are even almost taken out of the same playbook. So what is the difference now? First, I believe there is an oversaturation of the market, especially in the things that are typically purchased during these panics, which is AR-15s or related firearms and the ammunition that they use. Now, if we go back to 2012, even backing up earlier to that, to 2004, 2004, we had the sunset of the assault weapons ban of 1994. It was not reinstated and did expire. Now, during the assault weapons ban, there were certain evil features, we call them, that were removed from use on those rifles. They were functionally the same, but they could not have things like threaded barrels, bayonet lugs, or pistol grips, or they could not have more than one of those types of features. Now, during that ban era, there were companies like Colt that were still making AR-15s uh, and uh, related types of firearms that would just have been modified to fit into compliance with those laws but the overall uh, function or even lethality of the firearms in general was not changed. So with the expiration of the assault weapons ban in 2004, we now have companies coming out with so-called unmodified or their traditional or unbastardized, if you will, firearms that fit into that certain class. So now AR-15s are being manufactured with threaded muzzles and birdcage, birdcage flash hiders and bayonet lugs and adjustable stocks. Because of that 10-year period, there was a in growing interest in those firearms. In the 1990s and the 1980s, actually, AR-15s and AKMs and things like that were very fringe, and not very many people owned them. In fact, the general uh, political and social view of those types of firearms, that they belonged in the collections of those that were paramilitary-type wackos. I mean, for many of you who grew up in the 80s and 90s, you probably remember that it was a top break shotgun or the 22 revolver um, or, or the 38 caliber revolver that was a pretty much, pretty much dominant. It wasn't really, it was really the gung ho gun, uh, you know, people really into gun culture were interested in buying things like the Colt SP ones and the AR 15s that were actually introduced in the 1960s. Now there was a fundamental shift of public opinion through the nineties into the two thousands when all of a sudden there's this thing that the government doesn't want people to have. And when, the assault weapons ban would end, there would be a huge purchasing interest of those types of firearms. Now with that, you would have an emergence of a lot of companies that would start to be founded to meet the demand of those firearms. Now that was still a pretty nascent idea. 2004 to 2012 is only an eight year period. And yes, a couple uh, firearms manufacturers did develop. Uh, during that time, existing manufacturers like Smith & Wesson that did not manufacture AR-15s or related firearms actually would release things like the M&P-15 in 2006. But other companies that would put out things since then, like Ruger and uh, DPMS and uh, Delton or even Palmetto State Armory, were not doing, were not producing those firearms in mass like they are today. Now, if you fast forward to Sandy Hook, of course, a Bushmaster AR-15, which Bushmaster was a, a brand that pre-existed. I, mean, I believe Bushmaster is a brand developed somewhere around in the 90s. I know that they were around during the ban era. Uh, Bushmaster was a long-lived manufacturer of predominantly AR-15s. They had other, you know, bullpup type rifles and stuff too. Um, one was used at Sandy Hook, and that was became the target of the attention of the gun control lobby uh, and people who wanted to see further restriction on firearms and the so-called assault rifles and such. Now, because of that, there was a huge political push on banning those items, and there was a lot of belief by even inside the gun community that those sorts of things would actually be banned. Now, in reality, they never were banned, and I think that that plays into the public perception today. Um, but what that did lead into was a massive surge in the purchasing of those firearms and related ammunition and accessories. What that also opened the floodgates to was new manufacturers who would start putting these things out into the market. Delton in 2013, 
You have Palmetto State Armory who put out their first completed AR-15 product in about 2015. You had a huge opening of O1 FFLs. I know we opened in 2014. Uh, in the Indianapolis area, there were probably four or five dealers. Today, there's probably 30. So that was the huge sort of ignition of the powder keg of the pent-up fear and demand for those types of products. Now, since then, a huge swath of AR-15s have been produced on the market, and some of them at very affordable prices. And to this point that anybody who's a gun owner, you've heard the term that the AR-15 is now America's rifle, that's actually kind of become true. And almost one in three firearms that have been sold between 2012 and 2020 was an AR-15 variant of some kind. So they are very prominent and prolific out there uh, in private collections and in the hands of private gun owners. Gun stores, um, there are so many of them that in fact, I'm noticing and have noticed for some time as a gun store owner that they do not sell very well, not nearly as well as they used to because of the severe market saturation of AR-15s that exist. So when things like this happen and AR-15s are brought up on the chopping block, I think even if people really believe that they were to be banned, there's one of two ways it can go. One is existing AR-15s would be grandfathered, in which case everybody has one already, or multiple, or knows people who have one or multiple, or there's so many in private hands that the secondary market of AR-15s is so large that it would not be difficult to find one and buy one if you so wanted to in the future. Or if they weren't grandfathered in and you had to turn them in to be destroyed, that a lot of people would want to sell them off before that would happen to not be stuck with something illegal that they have to destroy for no return of, of their investment. So typically in situations like this that I've noticed between 2014 and 2020, after a high profile shooting like this, it usually goes one of two way. We either buy a whole bunch of them from people trying to get rid of them, thinking they're about to be banned, or a bunch of people come in and buy them, um, which sort of creates a sort of neutral inflow and outflow of firearms. It's usually pretty predictable, uh, but I am seeing neither now. Um, and it's, it's been uh, close to a week since the shooting happened, um, and, uh, and I'm seeing absolutely no change in that. In fact, I'm seeing more people trying to dump firearms with pistol braces because of impending legislation on pistol braces. I don't think people generally believe that an assault weapons ban is actually imminent. That leads me into my second point, and that is lack of belief of legislation. Now, time and time again, there have been shootings, unfortunately. And when those shootings occur, there is a lot of grandstanding about different political things that should be done to ban firearms. Um, usually these things would require a supermajority vote, which Democrats, not, not even in the Democratic Party, there's usually a few holdouts who don't want to see any type of wide-scale gun control. Where you start to see gun control is usually on the state level with things like California or New York, New York with concealed carry uh, restrictions, uh, California with magazine capacity, Colorado as well. A lot of those things are being struck down in the court system right now as we speak. Um, so when it comes to broad uh, sweeping legislation, there just doesn't seem to ever get anything done. And like the story of the little boy who cried wolf when the government and politicians beat on the war drum so many times and nothing ever happens as a result, people who would otherwise be worried about those things happening stop losing, or they, they, they stop providing interest and stop believing that it's going to happen. In 2012, I was absolutely certain there probably would be some sort of assault weapons ban. But now, any time an event like this happens, I am absolutely certain that there won't be. Just because there's, I mean, the, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. And that's what we tend to be doing, is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. And those results are never different. I don't believe I'm alone in feeling this way, or otherwise people would be out in large numbers today buying things which they are not. I will circle back on this when background check data for this month comes out in a month or two and we'll see if there was actually an uptick, but I actually believe it's probably the opposite and things are still continuing to slow down. Going along with that, I think the amount of people who have joined the Second Amendment or at least using their Second Amendment rights was drastically increased between 2020 and 2022 when we saw a huge pump of new first-time buyers enter the market due to fear of what was going on with the rioting and all of that happening. Uh, in those years following, you know, the, the, all the, the COVID uh, news that was going on. Um, as a gun store owner, we sold, it was probably three and four firearms we sold was to a new first time buyer. I know that we are not alone as a gun store in experiencing those levels. I know gun stores all over the country were experiencing that type of demand. Uh, and so uh, with, there are so many people more in the ranks, if you will, and the, uh, the view of, or the public opinion of private firearm ownership has definitely moved more towards a belief in the second amendment. I think that that's apparent as well. 
um, and sort of the backing off of hard stances on gun control and the political parties. And when it comes to uh, gun control today, I think, again, it's more on the state level or through agencies like the ATF reinterpreting existing laws on the books to try and put other firearms within the purview of those existing laws to get them removed from society, just like what we saw happen with the bump stock and what we are currently seeing happen with the arm brace. My third and final point, and this is the unfortunate one, is I believe mass shootings have officially become normalized in society. I don't know if I'm alone in feeling this way, but what I felt after Sandy Hook happening, uh, I was in utter, I, I mean, I remember feeling like the, the wind was knocked out of me. We had never had, we, we had had shootings, actually not that many as of 2012, uh, but definitely not one where children uh, and first graders were the target, at least not that I'm aware of or can remember. I believe in the 1930s, there was a bombing at an elementary school. Uh, and I know in 1989, there was a shooting at a, a playground in Stockton, California, which unfortunately killed five children. But I mean, uh, a large mass uh, shooting of, of children where there are, were many casualties. That is the, the first that I can remember in sort of modern uh, history or society. Since then, in the past 10 years, there have been many high profile shootings. And it has gotten to the point where when you hear about these things, uh, not only are they less impactful, uh, on everybody, but they are less newsworthy. Um, you tend to ha have a high profile shooting like what happened at the Tops grocery store where 10 people were tragically murdered. And if you compare the coverage that that received to what happened at Aurora, Colorado, which I believe was also in 2012, the, the Aurora, Colorado shooting coverage lasted for months, whereas the Tops grocery store shooting lasted for days. Um, and of, of course it was overshadowed by what happened here, but I believe within a week or two, uh, the news cycle will have even moved on to something else, even with something as horrific as children losing their lives. So I think as a society, you're, you're typically motivated uh, for legislation when things are um, overwhelmingly uh, abnormal and uh, something that is uh, severe enough to warrant those changes and the dullness on the American society of the impact of these shootings is starting to become very apparent. Uh, for example, the even though 10 people were were, uh, were murdered in a bout of a racially fueled uh, uh, attack in, in Buffalo, New York, uh, the Johnny Depp Amber Heard uh, trial was still trending over that event. That just leads me to believe that society, as a fact, is sort of what somewhat accepted that this is just part of our everyday society. I, I do think that that is sad, but I think it's also true and when society accepts that something is the way it is, there tends to be less of a demand by the public to really do anything to address that, whether it's gun control or anything else. Um, and so I think, you know, when these sorts of things happen, people sort of shrug their shoulders and go on with life. If you don't believe me, go to the, uh, to the social media news feed of any of your friends who are either calling for gun control or who are calling for increases in mental health. You're going to see that everything they post uh, since Tuesday is is about that, but give it two weeks and they'll be back to posting cat and family related memes and going on with life. Uh, you can go through the history of their news feeds as well and see that anytime they posted this stuff, it likely corresponds with a high profile shooting within a week or two and that's it. There is no long term uh, commitment to solving these issues such as joining organizations, making donations, or actually contributing their own time and resources to studying these events or trying to offer up a solution is typically a very quick knee-jerk, uh, again, visceral human reaction, a need to reach out to other people who feel the same way to get a sort of, sort of that feeling of consolidarity or solidarity, I should say. And then when the emotions have worn off, it's back to life as usual until the event happens again, and unfortunately, it will happen again. So those are my thoughts on this issue. If you like this video or found it useful or interesting, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to my channel and hit that bell notification button so you are aware when we are posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.